In 1939, a letter delivered by the esteemed physicist Albert Einstein to the then U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt resulted in the United States taking a gamble. As World War II erupted into a destructive global conflict, Roosevelt ordered the establishment of the U.S. Uranium Project to investigate the possibility of creating a controlled chain reaction. In June 1942, the Uranium Project fell under the control of the U.S. military and was renamed the Manhattan Project. And in December of that year, under a Chicago football stadium, the world's first controlled nuclear reaction was achieved. With the war looking more and more like it would end in an Allied defeat, what followed was the birth of the single biggest weapons development project the world had ever seen. The Manhattan Project that the, the Americans developed, which was the scientific and the military uh, development of these weapons, was just enormous. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of workers worked on sites, what, 17 sites in 12 states, huge secret cities built across the US, all feeding into this enterprise. It was a colossal program. One team at Los Alamos, led by Robert Oppenheimer, worked on the physics of the bomb. Huge industrial plants in Tennessee and Washington state were established to extract the plutonium, each arm of the massive operation working in extreme secrecy. After five years of frenetic research and billions of dollars, on July the 16th, 1945, the Manhattan Project came to fruition. A device was successfully exploded in the New Mexico desert. With a force of 22 kilotons, the equivalent of 22,000 tons of TNT, it dwarfed anything that had come before it. One of the most profound and, and moving aspects of the whole atomic weapon story is that the, the men, mostly men, the men who developed the bomb, were the first to become aware of what the destructive capacity of the bomb was. And they debated within themselves whether or not they should be allowing this to happen. And I think one of the considerations that swayed them into regarding this as, as being uh, justifiable was that the, many of them knew exactly what they were up against. Many of them were Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany who knew what had happened to Europe's Jews and knew the costs of not defeating Nazi Germany. And while the atomic bomb may have been designed with Germany in mind, by the time the atomic bomb was completed, Hitler was gone and the Germans had surrendered. But the Allies were still at war with Japan. A little after 8.15 a.m. on the 6th of August, 1945, the Enola Gay, a heavily modified B-29 bomber, dropped a device measuring just three meters in length, 71 centimeters in diameter, and weighing just 4,000 kilograms over the unsuspecting Japanese city of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, a manufacturing center of 350,000 people, located about 800 kilometers from Tokyo, had not been randomly selected as a target for the atomic bomb. It had been chosen. Firstly, because up until this point in the war, Unlike Tokyo, it had been largely unscathed by conventional bombing. And secondly, because the city was flat. The bomb went off. Three and a half kilometers of destruction, a, a fireball that big killed probably 80,000 people more or less instantly, wounded about another 80,000 people. And because it was a flat site, the impact of the bomb went for miles and in a circular way, diminishing as it, it progressed, but still devastating, utterly destroying the city. When Little Boy, as the bomb was called, detonated 580 meters above the city, it did so with a force equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT. As it exploded, intense heat rays and radiation were released in all directions. And almost instantly, 13 square kilometers of that city was transformed into ruins. 
And when that city's devastation failed to elicit a Japanese surrender, just three days later, a second weapon, Fat Man, was deployed. But heavy smoke and cloud cover over the city of Kokura caused a mid-mission diversion to the secondary target, the port city of Nagasaki. Not an ideal target from the bomb maker's point of view because it was a, a hill, it was in a valley, and so the blast was constrained. But even so, it, it killed 40,000 people. Fat Man had an energy yield of approximately 22 kilotons of TNT, and the fireball caused by the explosion was 280 meters in diameter, creating a surface temperature of around 5,000 degrees Celsius. The role of the two weapons in ending the war remains the subject of ongoing debate. Emperor Hirohito's decision to surrender was also influenced by Russia's invasion of Manchuria and declaration of war against Japan on August 8th. But one thing is certain, the world has never been the same since. One of the claims that's made about the use of Little Boy and Fat Man on Japan was that one of the major reasons for doing it was not so much to defeat Japan, but to signal to Russia that the US had this incredible new capability. Whether that's true or not, uh, I certainly don't know. But what is certainly true is that the creation of atomic weapons radically changed the global strategic environment. A change that would lead to a 40-year period of uncertainty known as the Cold War. In 1945, there had been just three nuclear weapons on the planet. By 1950, there were 304, 299 in the US arsenal, and five in the Soviet unions. So we entered into the era of the Cold War, and it was a Cold War for a reason. Although there were many hot spots, the two great powers that were competing never went to war against each other. And probably the main reason for that is the existence of nuclear weapons. But even a Cold War can be won. Determined to maintain their lead in what was now a nuclear arms race, in October 1952, the Americans conducted Operation Ivy on the Eniwetok Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The plan was to detonate a device named Mike, an experiment with a higher yielding form of nuclear explosion that derives a significant proportion of its explosive energy from fusion. A thermonuclear device, Mike was the first of what we now know as a hydrogen bomb. At 7.15 a.m. local time, on the 31st of October, 1952, Mike was detonated from a control ship stationed 55 kilometers away. The detonation resulted in a massive explosion equivalent to 500 times the explosive force of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki just seven years earlier. Four, three, two, one. After the test was confirmed to the public, Time magazine reported that the force and horror of atomic weapons has entered a new dimension. The first full-dress H-blast turned the mid-Pacific sandspit named Illusia Lab into a submarine crater. And indeed, it had. Illusia Lab, the atoll on which Mike's detonation took place, was vaporized. The explosion produced a fireball six kilometers in diameter and a mushroom cloud 160 kilometers wide. Unsurprisingly, in 1952, it was the largest nuclear explosion ever detonated. And as the tests continued on both sides, and with the development of missiles to deliver warheads, the numbers of nuclear weapons skyrocketed, a proliferation that changed the nature of warfare. At the heart of the idea of nuclear deterrence 
is something called mutually assured destruction or mad. And, and that term is, is quite literally chosen. The idea is that you would be simply mad to start a nuclear war because where the other side had the ability to wipe you out if you launched against them and they had the ability to launch before you could guarantee that you'd taken out all of their nuclear capabilities. In starting a war, you would essentially choose to destroy yourself. In 1955, there were 2,636 warheads, of which the Americans had 2,400. By 1965, that number had increased to over 35,000, as the US and Russia battled for supremacy. With enough weapons to destroy the planet several times over, an uneasy status quo emerged. Great powers simply couldn't afford to go to war with one another. And that's what nuclear deterrence relies on. The incredible power of the opposing nuclear forces means that there are no rational ways to start a war with one another. At the height of the third phase of the Cold War, the world was home to over 61,000 nuclear weapons. That number has now dropped to a little over 16,000. But should they ever be used, mass destruction would result of a kind that the men of World War I, a mere 100 years ago, could never have imagined. <laughs>